twelve and a quarter year span. So the cycles of the sun and the cycles of the moon have a serious impact. The cycles of the moon have more a larger impact on the feminine of the nature. I'm not talking about male and female, I'm talking about masculine and feminine as two different qualities in nature. When I talk about this as masculine and feminine, not as male and female, male and female is just a byproduct of the masculine and the feminine nature which exists in nature. In the yogic system, you will see always a full-grown yogi means he is depicted as half man, his right hand side is man, the left hand side is a female body. He is always depicted like this, a full-grown grown yogi means both the masculine and feminine in him has grown to its fullest extent. The logical and the intuitive, the masculine and the feminine, the ability to conquer and the ability to embrace, both of them have grown within him to its fullest capability. So, when we talk about the nature of human development on the planet, we have been at a stage where survival has been an issue for a long time. In our perspective, it's a long time, but in the life of the planet, a few thousand years is not a long time. In these few thousand years, survival has been the biggest issue. When survival is the biggest issue, masculine was most important, naturally, procurement was most important. Fighting it out for every piece of bread was most important. Now, like never before, though still many areas of the world have to be handled, still like never before, our food and survival has been organized like never before. Never before in the history of humanity was survival process as well organized as it is today. Today, if you have the money, you can go to the superstore and buy everything that you need for the next one year and not step out of your house for one year. This was not possible. Every day you had to go for water, every day you had to go out for food, every day you had to go out for everything. This is only in this generation that we are beginning to experience this. So this is the generation where slowly feminine can find its expression. My concern right now is, because we are a transiting generation from survival process to evolving into other dimensions of human potential and capability. Here, the feminine becomes important and here it's very, very important that we do not mold success around masculine nature. Right now, if a woman wants to be successful, she has to be like a man, go get it. This has to change, our idea of success has to change so that it is not fitting into masculine mold where all women will become like men in some way to be successful. Because killing of the feminine is happening rampantly in the last uh, maybe twelve, fifteen hundred years. This has been an active process because somewhere we find feminine, we have misunderstood gentleness as weakness. We have misunderstood softness as uh, a useless process of life. Our idea of strength is like this. This has to go. Our idea of strength has to change. Our idea of success has to change. Our idea of what it means to… from conquest to inclusion, it has to happen. Right now, our idea of having something is to conquer that. If… if you conquer somebody, you can sit on top of their head, they may be… <laughs> they may be under your control in one dimension of life, but as long as you sit on somebody's head, you will always be at the risk of <laughs> not being able to leave that place one thing. And always, they will make sure your life is miserable. If you conquer somebody, the conquered people, they may not be able to get liberated, but they will make sure your life is miserable for sure. So if life has to happen beautifully, from conquest to inclusion, from masculine to feminine, the shift has to happen. I am not saying from male to female, I am insisting from masculine to feminine needs to happen. The feminine has to flower and flourish. A time has come for that because survival is not the biggest issue anymore. 
we can relax our masculine nature a little bit and allow the feminine to flower. If that answers your question, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Sadhguru, what's your greatest passion in life? I'm sorry? What's your greatest passion? Oh, <laughs> I do not know how not to be passionate about anything. <laughs> I'm sorry? Oh, I'm very passionate about them. Am I not speaking to you passionately? Am I speaking to you without involvement? See, passion essentially means involvement, isn't it? Hmm? Can you be passionate without involvement? No. Right now, people have understood passion as a unidimensional thing. A man and woman is sitting together, that is passion. No, you can be passionate with the whole universe, why not? Why are you passionate with one thing and not passionate with the other? It's a crime. It's a crime against humanity and life that your passion is limited to one or two things. Whatever you set your eyes upon right now, you must be absolutely involved with it, isn't it? If you're involved with it, there is a passion. And if your passion is not discriminatory, if your passion is universal, then you become compassion. Compassion means all-encompassing passion. Compassion doesn't mean kindness. Kindness is only useful for those who have fallen. Yes? Yes or no? For the sick and the dying, kindness is good. For one who is doing well, he doesn't want to be treated kindly or compassionately. He wants to be treated with passion, isn't it? <laughs> yes or no? Hello? The word passion is used in a very limited way, always referring to two people's engagement. No. How can you not be passionate about anything that you're in touch with? I'm talking in terms of the very air you breathe, the earth that you walk upon and everything else that is in touch with you right now. If you're not passionate, it essentially means you don't care a damn for what's around you, isn't it? Hello. If I'm not passionate with you, what it means is I don't care a damn for you. I've come here to deliver something. No, I'm not coming here to deliver anything. I'm here because I'm passionate about every piece of life. You, because you mentioned women, Can I tell you a bit of a story? Is it okay? Hello? Hello, I'm talking to you. <laughs> I had a great grandmother who lived up to 113, 113 years of age. <laughs> people, uh, those days, people said, she's a devil of a woman. <laughs> because <laughs> if she laughed, the whole street shook. In those days, a woman was not supposed to laugh loudly. I don't know how they managed to live with women who could not laugh. It must have been torturous <laughs> So she laughed in such a way that the whole street shook when she laughed. So people said she laughs like a devil. I was just four or five years of age. I thought, if the devil is the one who laughs, Somehow he seems to be more attractive to me and she was more attractive to me than anybody around because she laughed in such a way. I saw her in all kinds of states, she would be laughing and crying at the same time, singing and dancing and laughing and crying. She was over hundred at that time. When I saw her, she had crossed hundred mark. And uh, I've seen these things happening. In the morning people give her a breakfast. When she was sixty-eight years of age, after she buried her husband and many of her children and a few grandchildren, because she got married at fourteen, by sixty-eight she had seen everybody coming and going <laughs> So she left the family, built a small place for herself with her own hands and lived there. When we went there for vacations to our ancestral home, she would always come to see the children. And when somebody gave her breakfast, she would just first take the breakfast to the ants, to the birds, to the squirrels and she would watch them eating. And there were people who were self-appointed advisors who said, you old woman, you don't eat anything, you will die one day. 
all these advisors, advisors died, but she continued to live. <laughs> I've seen her many times, she would just watch the ants eating the food and tears would be flowing. I thought she's just emotional about these ants. And when people said, why don't you eat? She would say, I'm full. I thought, this is some stupid emotion. It took me twenty-five years to experientially come to the same place where how you could be nurtured by things around you. It is not just the food that you eat which does things to you, it is the level of involvement and contact that you have with life which does things to you. You could be well nourished without eating anything for quite substantial amounts of time. She was a living example of that, so that's the first woman who made a big impression on me. And my mother, <laughs> I think in many ways uh, she played a very significant role, I didn't uh, handle it that way at that time. I remember as children, if we traveled somewhere, my mother did everything in the house, okay? She never involved herself in any economic activity as it is today, but uh, for the four of the siblings that we had, that we were, she did everything in the house, she stitched, she embroidered, she cooked and she worked. She was definitely the most valued person in the home, not because she brought money home, simply because she was home. Very easily I can imagine my life without my father, I can never imagine my life without her. So when we traveled, uh, she would look at the pillowcases and empty pillowcases, white sheets, she would say, how can children on empty pillowcases and right there she would pull out her sewing needle and thread and she would make one tiny little flower or a green parrot on the pillowcase. I… I remember any number of nights when I'm lying down, that little green parrot sank so deep into my consciousness that somebody was always there placing someone else's life as a more important thing than her own life. I think that's the bedrock of my life today. I don't stitch green parrots, but I do similar things to people <laughs> all the time. <laughs> and uh, then my wife, she was my… like my shadow. And now many, many women around me, my daughter and many others, over seventy percent of uh, important positions in Isha Foundation are held by women. Not because they're women, I don't choose people by gender. I just go by their competence. What I see is if you provide a safe enough and a respectful enough space, a woman's creativity flowers wonderfully. A lot of her time is gone in life, just trying to look right, sit right, stand right. All her intelligence and her effort and her energy is gone in this in the world because she's already always seen as a showpiece. She's always trying to sit right, dress right, look right. A whole lot of energy and time is gone in this. If you take away this, if you just provide them a respectful and a safe place, I find they're doing wonderfully well. As I said, seventy percent of important positions in the foundation are held by the women, not because of their gender simply because of their competence. And here I am with you today <laughs> Sadhguru, speaking uh, about Isha Foundation, Isha Foundation is a hundred percent volunteer-led organization. How did you manage to involve more than two million volunteers in your projects and what is the significance of volunteering? Oh, the word volunteer literally means uh, one who is willing. If you're not willing for life, I don't know why the hell you're here. You must be willing. Are you a hundred percent yes for life? I'm asking you. Hello? Are you a one hundred percent yes for life? That means you're a volunteer. That means you must be doing things what you truly care for in your life, not some rubbish that somebody else values. So I made this impression on people that in your life, you must be doing what you care for. You do not do anything that you don't care for. 
Because if you're doing some rubbish that you don't care for, your life is a wasted life. You need to understand, first of all, the most important thing that everybody needs to constantly remind themselves of is that you are mortal. That means you have an expiry date. That means it's ticking away right now. Yes or no? Oh, you don't like this? Whether it's you or me, right now, we may think we are going to many places, but actually we are rushing towards the grave. <laughs> this is a fact. If you are constantly aware of this, you will not have time to do anything other than what truly matters to you, isn't it? And every human being should be doing only that which truly matters to you. When I went to school, this was my biggest problem. My problem is, the teachers are talking about something that doesn't mean a damn thing to them and I don't want to listen to them. I'm not willing to listen to anybody if they're speaking about something. It doesn't matter how great the subject is. If it doesn't mean anything to them, I don't see why I should listen to it. It doesn't matter how simple a matter it is, if it means something to you, I'm willing to listen to it. <laughs> because if it doesn't mean anything to you, why are you even uttering it, first of all? This is always my question. So I went to school in a very strange condition. I must say something about this. <clears throat> when I was three, four years of age, I realized one thing. I suddenly realized I don't know anything. See, people have misunderstood, I do not know. I do not know is the biggest possibility in your life. The most immense thing in your life is, I do not know. If you see, I do not know, the longing to know is inevitable. The seeking to know will follow, knowing will naturally happen out of this. So when I was about four, I suddenly realized I don't know anything. If somebody gives me a glass of water, I would not know what water is. I would simply be staring at water three, four hours at a stretch. Well, I knew that if I drink this water, it'll quench my thirst and different ways of using it. But even today, you do not know what water is, isn't it? It's the only thing present on this planet in all the three states. Two-thirds of the planet is water, two-thirds of your body is water. If we want to look for life, we look for a drop of water. But do we really know what it is? We know how to use everything. We do not know what it is. If we recognize that we do not even know a leaf, we would walk a little more gently and respectfully on this planet. Right now, we're in a wanton state of thinking that we know everything. <laughs> So when I realized I do not know anything, if I find a leaf, I'm staring at it. I sit up in my bed, whole night I'm staring at the darkness. My dear father, being a physician, started thinking that uh, I need psychiatric evaluation. His problem was, this boy is staring at something all the time. Without blinking, he's staring, he's lost it. My problem is, I look at this, I still don't know this, how do I shift my attention to something else? I'm just stuck with this. So in this condition, they sent me to school. I went to school, my mother said, you must pay attention to the teacher. I just paid attention to the teacher. <laughs> the kind of attention that they had never received in their lives. <laughs> I would know the teachers past, present and future, but what they were speaking, Initially, I could make out the meanings of the words. Suddenly, one day I realized, they're only making noises or sounds and I'm making up the meanings in my head. See, even now, if you do not understand English, I'm only making sounds, isn't it? Language is a conspiracy between two people. If I make this sound, you make up that meaning. If I make another sound, you make up another me meaning. Suppose I start speaking in some other language, an Indian language that you do not understand, as far as you're concerned, it'll be just sounds, isn't it? So when I realized they're only making sounds, I'm making up the meanings, I stopped making the meanings. And suddenly it became such fun. See, this is a problem. The moment you don't understand something, most human beings do not pay attention. This is something we have to correct. 
what we do not understand needs more of our attention than what we think we understand, isn't it? If you pay absolute attention, you must do this. You turn on a Chinese channel today on the television, simply sit there with absolute attention. You will see after some time, it will become so amusing the whole human activity. So a big smile spread on my face, but the teachers were not amused at all with this. My education went like this. I remember when I was in my… Uh, you know, in my school, Every month, I don't know if you have such a system in Qatar, uh, monthly report cards you have… your parents have to sign. Hmm? So when this day comes, I saw some children strutting around because they are first or second, some children crying, they are afraid to go home, like this. Never once did I ever open this report card. The teachers gave it to me, I took it and gave it to my father. I thought this is a transaction between my teacher and my father. I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> 